Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good evening or good morning, depending on where you are. My name is Frank from Wisconsin Medical. <clears throat> you are so welcome to attend our Wisconsin Global Dandelion Program with a mission to widely popularize the point of care ultrasound utilization in medical practice, such as anesthesiology, pain management, MSK, intensive care, and emergency medicine. By in cooperation with different experts across the globe to do online webinars or in-person workshop trainings. So far, we have already completed over 700 webinars nationally and internationally since 2020. Attracted over 180,000 doctors attended, received over 3.2 million reviews and comments. This time, we are honored to have invited eight renowned MSK experts in the United States to practice our to participation participate in our program, MSK ultrasound webinar series. In the upcoming two months, they will deliver a comprehensive webinar series about musculoskeletal, including lecture topics on also biological therapies and the ultrasound utilization in MSK practice. Covering common body parts like shoulder, elbow, hand, wrist, hip, foot, ankle, and knee. Here, I would like to express our most gratitude to these eight respectable, respectable experts. Thank you. So, uh, I will show my screen to you and introduce our topics and our uh, speaker and uh, moderator today. So today is the first webinar of our uh, MSK ultrasound webinar series. We invited uh, Dr. Ariana Demers as speaker and Mark Coaster as moderator to lecture with the topic on also biological therapies. Mark Coaster has abundant experience in MSK and ultrasound. He has MSK and cardiac diagnostic ultrasound work since 2008 became ultrasound consultant since 2012 and the MSK instructor since 2014. He's a member of uh, several famer, famous societies like American Registry for Diagnostic Medical Soci uh, Sonogra Sonography Society and the Society for Diagnostic Medical Sonography. Moreover, he will be the regular moderator for all of the seven webinars in this MSK ultrasound webinar series. So, Mark, could you please introduce today's speaker, Dr. Ariana Demers? Good evening, everybody. I'm going to just share my screen here. Okay. I'm going to get started in introducing you to the guest speaker for this evening. And let's see. There we go. Can everybody see my screen? Uh, not yet. It's taking a little time here. Okay, we can wait. Let me know when you see it. Okay. Not yet, huh? Uh, not yet. Maybe you can try again. Screen share. There it goes. He was working earlier. How about now? Uh, it's okay, I can help you. Uh, 
If we would yeah, like. if you just yeah, if you just want to put her screen up. Apparently, mine's not working for some reason today. I can help you to share the screen. Don't worry, it's it's okay. Here, can he? Can you see the uh, PPT slide? Not quite yet. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Here I am. There you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Little glitch this evening, but let me introduce you to uh, our speaker tonight. It's Ariana Demers. She is a DO in RMSK. She's board certified in orthopedic surgery and fellowship trained in sports medicine. Her practice encompasses athletes of all levels of accomplishment and all stages of life. She specializes in minimally invasive orthoscopic procedures to treat injuries of the hip, shoulder, knee, and ankle, as well as regenerative medicine. She is a current president of International Orthobiologic Foundation. She founded Restore Orthopedics and Sports Medicine at, as an orthopedic center where patients can get an unbiased diagnosis and complete discussion of their non-surgical and surgical treatment options, including orthopologics, as well as orthopedic surgery. She takes an innovative approach to get patients back to their healthy, active lifestyle. She's also passionate about driving change in our healthcare system to improve the lives of patients and doctors. So let's welcome Dr. Demers on orthobiologics. Thank you so much for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Perfect. And then we'll just advance to the slides. I'm really excited to be sharing this with you tonight. And uh, hopefully we can be able to uh, learn a little bit and uh, also figure out where we're going. You want me to share my own slides? I'm happy to do that. Frank, is that okay? Uh, not yet. Maybe you either will need one, uh, a, a few seconds. Sure. Let's see here. I have, just share my screen. Okay. Just quickly do this. Okay. Oh, it's okay now. All right, so we'll just go ahead and start this. Okay, so we'll just get started today. This is evidence-based orthobiologic therapies, including platelet-rich plasma, bone marrow concentrate, and adipose in 2022. I do have some disclosures. I am the president of International Interventional Orthobiologics Foundation. I also am an instructor for Interventional Orthobiologic Foundation as well as Orthosono MSK Ultrasound. I have some objectives today. I'm going to be defining or the orthobiologics that we're talking about, giving you some All evidence. Right. Dr. For you. Ariana Demers. Yes. Uh, from my screen, the PowerPoint presentation is just a, a part of the screen. Can you open, uh, zoom it to the full screen? Uh, I can give it a try. Can you not see it all? I can see the PowerPoint. Oh, now it's okay. That's Is that better? Good. It's better now. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for speaking up. We're also going to be talking about safety as well as some legal considerations, specifically in the United States. It will not uh, apply to other countries. Uh, and then also where we're using these orthobiologics and then very specifics uh, about the, the specific orthobiologics that we're talking about. So why orthobiologic therapies? I think the first thing that we want to talk about is we want to be using these therapies to either modify or reverse degenerative conditions such as arthritis. Additionally, there's been some disappointing 
current treatment outcomes. We know that knee replacement surgery has been less than uh, perfect and people are looking for other options. We also want to be using orthobiologics to enhance the natural healing process without surgery or improve the healing process with surgery or through surgery. And then always we're trying to decrease the pain and suffering from the degenerative de conditions of musculoskeletal disease. So what are we talking about? These orthobiologics, we have prolotherapy, platelet-rich plasma, bone marrow concentrate, and adipose-derived cells. I'm not gonna be talking about prolotherapy today, but we will be covering the rest of these orthobiologic treatments. So what is platelet-rich plasma? You've heard all the hype, we've talked about it a lot, but clearly it's defined as a volume of autologous plasma that has a platelet concentration above baseline. Our normal platelet counts are between 150,000 and 300,000 and averages about 200,000 per ml. PRP is defined as 1 million platelets per ml and this concentration is in a 5 ml volume of plasma. And you can talk, uh, take a look at Dr. Mark's work, which was uh, revolutionary in defining what platelet-rich plasma is. We also want to talk about dose. And really we wanna know how many platelets per ml multiplied by the number of mLs injected in a, in a specific area. Uh, and we'll be talking about how important this is a little bit later. So what is platelet-rich plasma exactly? So we take a, a, a sample of blood, we put it in centrifuge and spin it down on what we call the soft spin. And what that gives us is our platelet poor plasma. The platelet rich plasma is the middle layer and then red blood cells are trapped at the bottom. We then uh, extract that platelet poor plasma uh, as well as the platelet rich plasma. And we can talk about double spin or single spin, but really we want that buffy coat and the platelets are, are contained in that middle layer. I also wanna talk about levels of evidence. We're gonna be talking about evidence for use of platelet-rich plasma orthobiologics, such as uh, bone marrow concentrate and adipose cells. And my friend and, and colleague, Dr. Don Buford, did a really elegant study showing that our level of evidence in the top six orthopedic journals, um, and they reviewed a number of, of different journals, and in 2018 and 2019, 1400 articles and showed that the average level of evidence was a level three. So a randomized double blind randomized control trial is a level one evidence, expert opinion is level five and the average level of evidence is three in the top six orthopedic journals. So that's gonna be our baseline of what we're looking for, for evidence uh, that this may be an effective treatment. So where are we with the evidence? Looking at knee arthritis, we have really impressive evidence uh, with a randomized control trial level one, 610 people uh, with PRP versus saline showing PRP is better than saline for up to 60 months. And we had less chondral loss or it is chondroprotective up to 60 months, which is a really impressive uh, study that I think really highlights why we need to be looking at these. Uh, we also had a meta-analysis of 30 randomized controlled trials. So when somebody tells you that we don't have evidence for platelet-rich plasma use, we need to remind them that we have 30 randomized controlled trials. This is level one evidence showing that PRP is better for knee arthritis versus placebo, versus steroid, and versus hyaluronic acid injections at three, six, and 12 months. What about hip arthritis? We have level one evidence, randomized control trials showing that 50% uh, versus uh, hyaluronic acid, 50% advantage to total hip. In patients with PRP treatment, only 15% of those patients advanced to total hip, showing that leukocyte poor platelet rich plasma delayed need for total hip at two year follow up. We also see that we have a randomized control trial, PRP versus HA, showing that PRP functions better than HA for both pain and function and is durable up to 12 months. 
What about a gluteus tendinopathy? We have some really compelling level one randomized control trial, corticosteroid versus glucosite rich PRP. We have 80 hips, 40 in each group. Recording stopped. Recording in progress. At least a uh, significant improvement by 12 weeks. And at two years, this significant improvement was sustained. Our corticosteroids gave improvement by six weeks. By, by, by 24 weeks, this was not maintained. And this is a common treatment. This is what people use for this gluteus medius tendinopathy or a trochanteric bursitis. Uh, this is this uh, been used for a long period of time. And this shows that platelet-rich plasma injections are better. What about the JAMA Restore randomized control trial that concluded that PRP is not better than saline for patients of mid-grade arthritis? What this really shows is that we have to be more cognizant of concentration, of what the definition of platelet-rich plasma was. Because when you look, when you really dig into this study, this showed a concentration of 1.2 times concentration from baseline. This is not even considered technically PRP. And that what we are looking at is a 1.625 billion platelet injection per week is insufficient to treat arthritis. And what this article really helped us understand is that dosing does matter. And that low dose, low concentration platelet-rich plasma they are correct. It is not better than saline. Uh, so that helped us define the floor of what we're talking about for our, our dosing for knee arthritis for platelet-rich plasma. We also have uh, uses for chronic MCL sprain. And this is uh, been seen, it was an, actually an intraarticular injection weekly for three weeks. And this was, uh, the pain was improved by one month. I think that in uh, low-grade tendon uh, and ligament tears, this has been shown to be helpful. For ankle arthritis, we have uh, some level two evidence showing uh, a six-month and one-year follow-up. For uh, tibio-talar arthritis, pain was decreased by 50%. Now, this isn't the same ex experience as our really amazing outcomes from knee arthritis and hip arthritis, However, even a single 30 cc injection can decrease pain by 50%, and that's clinically significant. We're looking at ankle sprains. We have grade three, which is the worst uh, anterior talofibular ligament sprain, and we're treated with six cc's of a uh, reasonable dose uh, PRP. And the PRP group was better from one month to one year. If we look at Achilles, this has been a, a really problematic area, uh, treating it surgically, treating it conservatively. Uh, we're talking about non-insertional Achilles tendinopathy. And we saw that uh, level four evidence uh, at 50 months showed significant improvement for a leukocyte rich PRP injection. And when questioned, 91% of patients would repeat the treatment. Additionally, there was no rupture seen. The 2017 Boston study was a level one randomized control trial comparing corticosteroids, saline sham versus platelet-rich plasma, and all three groups did eccentric training. This was a 24-week follow-up, which it appears that probably this is a limited or short follow-up, especially for Achilles tendinopathy. However, we did have improvement with both PRP and corticosteroids at 24 weeks. Saline sham injection did not improve, even with eccentric uh, physical therapy. Uh, and that in the short term, corticosteroid was better but I think if we, this would have been followed out, uh, it would be very interesting to see if in the long term, platelet-rich plasma uh, provided a more durable uh, outcome. Rotator cuff tendinopathy and specifically partial thickness tears. This is really an interesting uh, subject to me. And we see in 2020, uh, intratendinous injection of one milliliter of PRP under ultrasound guidance showed a 70 success rate 
Um, and, and failures were predicted by either a type three acromion or AC joint arthropathy, but this is a very small injection under ultrasound guidance intratendinous with a quite high success rate. I think in 2021, a PRP uh, versus corticosteroid, uh, PRP intratendinous uh, and subacromial, corticosteroid was only subacromial. This is uh, level one uh, evidence of a leukocyte poor PRP, uh, 1.6 uh, concentration with a 10 cc blood draw uh, showing pretty low um, concentration of uh, platelets, but we still uh, showed that PRP had better pain and function at three months, but all things were equal at one year. So I think, I think again, this really clarifies that dosing matters and we really have to be cognizant of where we're putting the, 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 these orthobiologics, what the dose was and was it sufficient. Uh, we also are talking about rotator cuff in 2021, randomized controlled trial, PRP versus corticosteroid injection run, uh, for partial thickness rotator cuff tears. And this again was uh, the Arthrex ACP leukocyte poor PRP. And this does show even uh, low concentration uh, PRP was better than corticosteroids at six months. Looking at lateral uh, Con epicondylitis. Alan Mishra's study in, in 2013 was a landmark study showing that uh, leukocyte rich PRP plus dry needling versus dry needling alone showed improved success, 84% versus 68% success. And then the study in 2019 was a systematic review showing PRP is statistically and clinically better than the corticosteroid for lateral epicondylitis. What about, you know, uh, what about UCL tears, our partial tears? These are our throwing athletes. And in 2021, uh, with a level of evidence of three, uh, we had N of 50 and 64% were returned to throwing after one PRP injection. 10 patients had a second injection and, uh, and three returned to play. So we had an overall return to play uh, of 72% without surgery. These are, uh, are, when these are surgically repaired, uh, we know that it has a very high return to play rate, but it takes about 20 months. So this is a significant issue in, in the rehab process. And if we can uh, return to play 72 patients, those are 72%, those are all the patients that did not require surgery. Obviously for complete tears and, uh, for uh, multiple tears, we have to be more uh, specific about what we're talking about here. So sorry about that uh, screen. Looking at CMC or thumb arthritis, uh, as well as carpal tunnel, uh, we had a level one randomized control trial of two injection of PRP for two weeks, apart for CMC uh, arthritis versus steroid. PRP was better and lasted at least one year. Additionally, uh, for carpal tunnel, this was a really interesting study uh, as a level one randomized controlled trial in patients with bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. And on one side, they had 3.5 mLs of platelet-rich plasma versus steroid on the other side. And PRP was better every time up to one year. We have some evidence for uh, SI joint treatment uh, as well as caudal epidurals. Uh, the, we have level one evidence for leukocyte rich PRP versus corticosteroid for our caudal epidurals, showing that number one, leukocyte rich PRP was safe as well as leukocyte rich being better than corticosteroid epidurals from three to six months. If you look at SI joint injections for SI joint arthropathy, PRP injection. So this is a level three ultrasound uh, study that showed a two point pain decrease from one month to one year. And uh, PRP showed a 10% functional improvement. This was uh, fairly disappointing, but still uh, I think in patients who have SI joint arthritis, this is better than corticosteroid, which is what we're, we're providing now. We have some randomized control trials for lumbar disc, intradiscal PRP versus contrast as control. Uh, this was done by Greg Lutz's group. And uh, we know that PRP was better for pain and function at two months. And even at one year, 
it continued to be better than uh, control. So as far as safety is concerned, there's been no major advents of, uh, adverse events reported with an autologous blood-derived therapies. Uh, and reviews generally conclude it's, there's an inherent safety because it's autologous. Additionally, the most common adverse event is short-term pain at the injection site. And usually this is uh, attributed to the pro-inflammatory cytokine profile of PRP. Additionally, there has been concern for introducing bacteria into the injectate during processing, but PRP is inherently antimicrobial with white blood cell uh, concentrations, and there's been no reports of infection after platelet-rich plasma or platelet lysate injections that have been published in the, the recent literature. Regarding uh, USA FDA requirements, there are no FDA requirements, although there are the, the equipment used to produce PRP and the injections themselves have been cleared by the FDA. PRP injection procedure is considered investigational and it has not been approved by FDA, but because this is a substance that's provide, uh, derived from one's own blood, it is not considered a drug by the Federal Drug Administration and thus it is exempt from FDA regulations. So where do we use this based on evidence? I think there's overwhelming evidence to support uh, platelet-rich plasma use in knee arthritis, in tendinopathy, and ligament partial tears. I think there's very good support to support uh, use in carpal tunnel syndrome, lumbar disc disease, ankle arthritis, and ankle sprains, as well as CMC arthritis. There are some specifics that I wanted to touch on. There's a, this concept of leukocyte rich, where we keep the, the leukocytes versus leukocyte poor, where we filter that out. Uh, we did see that if for intra-articular injections, uh, we found a more favorable outcome with leukocyte poor uh, PRP, as well as uh, it, it provides a more anti-inflammatory uh, effect with less pro-inflammatory cytokines. We also showed a leukocyte rich, showing a less favorable outcome outcomes for synovia sites specifically in AGSM in 2014. So uh, you, conventional wisdom recommends leukocyte poor for intra-articular joint injections, leukocyte rich for the majority of other options uh, for treatment, especially ligament tendon, uh, those, ap uh, those applications. When we talk about concentration, there is uh, a number of ways to talk about concentration. Uh, there's a increased uh, from baseline of a factor of X. Um, and the problem with the X factor, uh, you know, 5X, 6X, 10X, is our baseline is variable. Not only is each individual baseline variable from time of day, day to day, uh, the baselines are variable across uh, patients. And so this is unfortunately not uh, a reproducible uh, way to measure the, the concentration. I think we do have to use cell counting, use a hemocytometer and count platelet uh, number or a, a minimum. And, and, and what we're really trying to do is look at minimum concentration for effect. Uh, if you don't have a hemocytometer, there are uh, companies uh, that you can send off for uh, quality control mechanisms to be able to know uh, if, if you're in the ballpark for your platelet-rich plasma concentrations. Our dosing is not agreed upon at this point. There was a most recent study um, in 2021 showing that 10 billion, a dose of 10 billion platelets is effective for pain relief and is chondroprotective in knee arthritis. So I think that while that, that may be, uh, we're, we're not at this point, uh, we don't know if that's the ceiling, if that's the floor, uh, but we do know that to the, the 10 billion has been effective for pain relief and chondroprotective uh, effect. We still unfortunately don't have a single classification system to be able to compare PRP studies and draw conclusions for our patients. Uh, it's imperative that if you're doing platelet-rich plasma research, we have to classify and report specifics on how the PRP was prepared, what, what dose and how it was quantified, and our technique of injection. We must collect data on all of our patients so we know uh, what uh, is was useful, what is not useful, what our dosing is uh, looking like. And we have to know what we're injecting to compare against literature for expected outcomes. Uh, we still have work to do, but the future is very bright. 
I'm going to be moving over to bone marrow concentrate. Uh, what is it? So bone marrow aspiration is considered BMA. Bone marrow aspirate concentration is BMAC or BMC. Uh, bone marrow concentrate uh, contains mesenchymal stem cells called MSCs, uh, hematopoietic stem cells and HSCs, platelets, which contain growth factors and multiple cytokines. There are anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory uh, modulatory properties of bone marrow concentrate stem cells that can facilitate regeneration of tissue. Additionally, the BMC can enhance quality of cartilage repair by increasing the aggregate content and tissue firmness. So we know bone marrow concentrate contains MSCs and HSCs, and we've heard all about MSCs being the most uh, important uh, cell to be able to know about. This is a, a rare cell. It's one in 10,000 cells in bone marrow. The, the majority of the cells are hemopneumatic uh, stem cells, making white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets. Together, they total about 18 million per ml of bone marrow. And this is very different than PRP. This is a mix of cellular components. We know it's much higher in white blood cells. It's higher in uh, IRAP, interleukin uh, receptor uh, antagonists, interleukin-1, interleukin-8. And when we talk about MSCs, Arnold Kaplan, who is the, the uh, gentleman uh, the, who coined the term mesenchymal stem cells, has now come out and said, no, no, no. We don't want to call them mesenchymal stem cells. It's not the cell itself. We want to call them medicinal signaling cells uh, instead. So MSCs uh, that we are talking about are medicinal signaling cells. And, and why do we say this? Because it's been really clear in the recent data that it's more of a, a paracrine effect. Uh, cell signaling within a discrete environment is how these uh, cells are uh, enacting and creating change. This is a nice summary looking at the difference between bone marrow aspirate on the left and bone marrow concentrate from two different companies versus whole blood and platelet rich plasma. As you can see, uh, the IRAP in uh, bone marrow concentrate is quite significant uh, and quite low in platelet rich plasma. Uh, our MSC content in bone marrow concentrate is higher and not present in whole blood or PRP. We have some TGF beta and uh, platelet drug growth factor much higher in uh, bone marrow concentrate than bone marrow aspirate, as well as very, very high in platelet rich plasma. We know that interleukin A, uh, 1 beta and uh, interleukin 8 are also elevated in bone marrow concentrate. So we have to also talk about how we best harvest bone marrow aspirate for bone our bone marrow concentrate. We know that there are, are reliable places, reliable sources of bone marrow aspirate for biologic augmentation. Uh, we have seen that probably the most reliable with the highest concentration is the posterior, uh, posterior uh, sacred iliac uh, spine, then the ASIS, proximal tibia, proximal humerus. Best practice is to preload the aspiration syringe with one ml of heparin. Uh, per 10 ml syringe. So that's a hundred, uh, excuse me, a thousand units per ml. We've seen that multiple sites, uh, minimum of one centimeter apart, uh, are, are helpful. Small aliquots of five to 10 ml per pull with a, a quick pull uh, gives us more uh, MSCs rather than a slow long pull, which may give us more peripheral blood. Some, patient, uh, some people are recommending a 200 uh, nanometer mesh filter to make sure that we filter out any bone spicules or uh, other uh, problematic uh, issues. We then have the Buffy coat layer and the platelet part plasma, which are extracted. This is a, a, what we're looking at following a bone marrow aspiration. Our bone marrow concentrate is uh, used with centrifugation. And this is a same day process with minimal manipulation of our cells, which complies with our FDA requirements, uh, which are minimally manipulated, homologous use and using a 510K uh, cleared device. As you can see, we have plasma on top, bone marrow concentrate in the middle, and then red blood cells um, at the bottom. 
just another dump, uh, another graphic to show what how we're using uh, centrifugation. We're drawing the platelet, pl uh, the plasma off the top, using the bone marrow uh, concentrate as that middle layer, and uh, discarding the RBC layer. So we we have to talk about cell counting. So you have to know and be able to quantify what you have. Uh, we have a couple of ways to talk about this. We have the TNCC, which is totally new total nucleated cell count, uh, as well as this colony forming unit or CFU. At this point, there's no linear correlation between the TNCC and the CFU. TNCC is something that you can do in your lab same day prior to injection. CFU is not something that you can do in your lab. Uh, you, it is a send out. You have to wait for the colonies to actually form. Um, additionally, each lab that you send our, your sample to uh, will count CFUs differently day to day and different between labs. Uh, there is some evidence for TNCC greater than 400 million to have greater efficacy in knee arthritis. This was done by uh, Dr. Kristen Tenno in 2015. And so there, there really is, there are some numbers out there that you can kind of hang your hat on as, as minimums or uh, goals, but there's still work to be done. Uh, we don't have full guidelines on dosing uh, and cell counting, but we are working towards a, a more uniform way uh, of, of applying these aspirates. You can use TNCC as a surrogate uh, for counting, you know, uh, as far as knowing your um, MSCs. We have our BMA, which is 18 million per ml of bone marrow, our bone marrow concentrate. If we if we've concentrated it at six times baseline, we're looking at 108 million per uh, ml. If we dose five mil uh, milliliters of BMC, we now then have a 540 million nucleated cells. And that does fall above that 4 million TNCC as a dose response. He, he had a really nice study of 424 knees at 12 months showing the VAS for, for patients treated above 400 million was 1.6 versus a VAS uh, or pain score for patients treated with uh, counts below 4 million TNCC was 3.2. Looking at our evidence for bone marrow concentrate, we're looking at knee arthritis, uh, and this is a, a, a nice uh, single injection, 50% pain reduction uh, at one year. Dr. Centeno level two randomized controlled trial versus exercise, uh, showing multiple injections with PRP, platelet lysate, and bone marrow concentrate, showing pain and function improved and maintained at the two year mark. We know that Dr. Uh, Anz uh, in 2020 showed a randomized controlled trial uh, showing bone marrow concentrate versus PRP to be equivalent. But we really take a look at uh, the concentration uh, and, and we're concerned that maybe this was low concentration bone marrow concentrate. And, and so maybe, uh, and then as well as the quality of the BMA draw, uh, and so maybe the there, what they found was that low concentration bone marrow concentrate may be equivalent to PRP. Uh, this has an, this has not been discussed as a high concentration bone marrow concentrate. We know from Dr. Hernigue's work uh, that bone marrow lesions and knee arthritis, uh, Dr. Hernigue just published this in 2020 showing level one data, 140 bone marrow concentrate intraosseous injections versus total knee done on the other side at 10 year average follow-up. He used 10 cc's intraosseous in the tibia, 10 cc's intraosseous in the femur. And we know that the bone marrow lesion was reduced by 50% at two years. And there was a risk of total knee replacement of only 1.2% per year. And on the other side, uh, risk of total knee revision was 1% per year. So this was a really elegant study that showed that even at 10 years, you have uh, approximately a 12% risk of total knee versus, uh, which is a really very durable treatment uh, for injection-based therapy without the risk of surgical intervention. We know uh, knee arthritis in 2022, BMAC versus uh, PRP, this is level three data, uh, showed 
that BMAC was a 30% better pain relief, 50% better function than PRP. Uh, these were small numbers, but this was clear. This is level three evidence. A bone marrow concentrate for knee arthritis, BMC versus PRP versus hyaluronic acid, uh, showing that BMC was better than leukocyte-rich PRP and hyaluronic acid, and that leukocyte-rich PRP showed better outcomes than hyaluronic acid, but was not statistically significant in their study that in their randomized controlled trial. If we look at hip, hip osteoarthritis uh, in 2021 versus microfracture with hip arthroscopy, uh, VAS as well as function was better with BMAC. In rotator cuff, BMAC and PRP versus exercise uh, for partial thickness rotator cuff tears. And we saw that both bone marrow concentrate as well as PRP uh, tear decreased uh, for both uh, exercise and PRP at three months, but uh, it was better, uh, the ASES function was better with BMAC and platelet-rich plasma treatment. As far as safety is concerned, uh, we have a 2009 uh, looking at uh, safety as well as in 2013. We know that Dr. Hernigue uh, published in 2018 showing that a 30-year follow-up prospective randomized controlled trial of 125 adults showed no increased cancer risk. Uh, and there, there's significant evidence that this is quite safe. Where do we use this? I think arthritis uh, evidence supports knee arthritis, hip arthritis, partial thickness rotator cuff tears. And when do we use this? It, it appears that probably uh, when we have failures of platelet-rich plasma or more severe disease, this is a, a, an appropriate application for bone marrow concentrate. Specifics on bone marrow concentrate, exercise for 30 minutes can mobilize adult stem cells into the peripheral blood. Fasting for three to five days can improve the number of uh, missing stem cells harvested. We do know that bupivacaine is cytotoxic at all concentrations and should not be used in bone marrow aspiration harvest as well as concentrate injections. Lidocaine is okay at low dose, 0.25%, and ropivacaine appears to not have effects on uh, MSC viability. There are some recommendations to stop anti-inflammatories prior to harvest and after injection to allow for our normal response to quote, our needle-based injury that we are providing to the tissue with our bone marrow concentrate. I'm gonna move on to adipose. Uh, so what is this? This is lipoaspirate that is obtained with a simple tumescence anesthesia and manual lipoaspirate with a low pressure syringe and harvesting cannula. Uh, we have some different uh, types of adipose tissues. The microfragmented adipose tissue is obtained by resizing and reducing that lipoaspirate tissue by mechanical processing. The tissues were rinsed and washed to remove oils, residues, red blood cells, and debris. Next step is stromal vascular fraction. This is a heterogeneous population of various immune precursor, progenitor, and stromal and stem cells. They are isolated from the lipoaspirate uh, or surgically harvested adipose tissue with enzymatic dissociation, centrifugation, and filtration. And then if you go one step further, and then you have adipose stem cells. These adipose stem cells are plastic adherent, culture expanded, from the enzyme digested stromal uh, vascular fraction. So this micro fat uh, is adipose. It's the stromal cells that are preserved in its native niche. It consists of adipocytes, the supporting matrix, which provides structural support, as well as the endothelial cells, fibroblasts, pericytes, smooth muscle cells, MSCs, leukocytes, lymphocytes, among others. Microfat is typically 300 to 600 nanom nanometers and is considered an autologous biologic substance that is uh, toward healing and restoration and repair of tissues. This is harvested again under tumescence anesthesia with mechanical processing, simple point of care procedure. Uh, cellular identity count and viability and sterility are not typically determined. And this is a heterogeneous makeup of cellular. Uh, 
interest uh, that is injected into an anatomical site. Uh, and then the pericytes are activated as our MSC. Pericytes are the, are the cellular uh, immune privileged cells that are on the outside of, of the uh, vascular portions of this uh, aspirate. This does meet USA FDA guidance of manual, minimal manipulation. Uh, this does have uh, preservation of the stem cell niche. Stromal vascular fraction is from the harvested lipoaspirate, and then it's processed enzymatically um, and then with centrifugation and filtration. The isolate usually has 500,000 to 2 million cells per gram of adipose, and adipose stem cells have 1 to 20 percent uh, versus um, bone marrow constant uh, versus the mechanical method. This is a thousand times more cells than the mechanical methods, and this is about 500 times more cells than obtained from bone marrow. If we're talking about adipose stem cells, these are culture expanded uh, from SVF. This is uh, manufactured in accordance with the good manufacturing practices. And our culture techniques uh, vary widely from fetal bovine serum to serum-free alternatives. And these, these uh, ASC or adipose stem cells have the ability to differentiate into different mesenchymal stem, uh, cell lineages. It's similar to bone marrow concentrate MSCs, but they do hold their phenotype better over the culture passages. Um, but this is definitely more than minimal manipulation um, and so has limited uh, use for clinical use at this time. So where's the clinical evidence? There's some pretty encouraging evidence for knee arthritis uh, with SVF with a good track record, MFATS encouraging. There's definitely improved pain and function and cartilage has variable improvement as measured by MRI. And there's an increasing number of randomized controlled trials. Definitely there's limited research on meniscus, shoulder arthritis, rotator cuff, hip osteoarthritis, as well as chondral lesions, ankle arthritis, and Achilles. So there's lots of knee studies for adipose uh, treatment. For MFAT, and we have all uh, sorts, we have osteoarthritis for MFAT with HAA and, HA and PRP versus MFAT plus or minus PRP with MFAT and MFAT versus BMC. We have uh, NeoA with SVF versus HA, age over 80, dosing versus BMAC. And then we have surgery uh, in NeoA. So MFAT plus arthroscopy, uh, MFAT plus arthroscopy and partial medial meniscectomy, uh, arthroscopy and adipose derived stem cells, arthroscopy with microfracture with or without SVF, um, and uh, obviously abrasion arthroplasty. So I, I showed, these are some of my favorite studies uh, that I think are, are quite helpful. This is a randomized controlled trial in patients uh, with early NEOA. They had three doses of HA and PRP versus a single MFAT. And uh, it showed significant, um, both, at, both the PRP as well as the uh, MFAT, Leaded, uh, they lead to clinical uh, and functional outcomes at six and 12 months, but it appeared that uh, the MFAT had better Tanger and Ku scores uh, as well at, at the 12 month mark. This is a, a randomized controlled trial, uh, SVF in one side, uh, bilateral NEOA, Calgary and uh, Lawrence two and three with HA in the other side. Uh, and really, the, my favorite part about this is that, number one, the, the SVF-treated knees showed significant improvement in uh, a 12-month follow-up uh, with vast WOMAC and range of motion. But more importantly, uh, that there was some significant improvement in articular cartilage in the SVF-treated knees compared to those treated with hyaluronic acid. I think this is a really interesting uh, uh, trial that talks about aged patients, patients over 80 uh, with grade two to grade four OA. These are 36 month case controlled. Uh, we had increased uh, pain, uh, improved pain, range of motion, walking and decreased medication use. At the two year mark, only 6% of patients transition to total joint. 
And of those two patients, so 3% had death after total joint. And so really there's clear benefits of SVF therapy in patients older than age 80 that are seeking a safe, effective, minimally invasive solution for their degenerative joint disease. We have a BMAC versus SVF showing, uh, this is a systematic review of 472 patients. SVF showed significantly better improvement on pain reduction than BMAC, uh, as well as uh, clinical effect from BMAC and SVF was equivalent. And there's been a number of studies that show that uh, SVF versus uh, BMAC or MFAT versus BMAC, those uh, functional outcomes are equivalent. When we look at arthroscopy and MFAT, we have 30 patients uh, with diffuse disease, and we have a knee scope plus MFAT showing significant improvement, 83% uh, improved in their VAS, 87% improved in their Tanger scores. When we look at shoulder arthritis, uh, this is really something that uh, is near and dear to my heart. Uh, we had 20 subjects. In, uh, in 18 patients with rotator cuff pathology and glenohumerarthritis, and they were injected under ultrasound guidance, uh, and they had significant pain score reduction from 7.9 to 3.7, which is really clinically significant at month 12. Uh, and we both had AS ES scores that improved from 3 33 pre-treatment to 66 at post-treatment at month 12, which is a, a really a, quite a significant improvement. We have uh, adipose derived stem cell injections enzymatically prepared, showing 90% reduction in for intratendinous injections of rotator cuff disease, 90% uh, reduction in that bursal sided defect. Uh, and the strength of the rotator cuff increased by 50% at the two year mark with high dose treatments. We're looking at rotator cuff arthroscopic rotator cuff repair plus. Uh, uh, ADCS, uh, which showed that the significant improvement in uh, failure rate of 28% uh, without the enhanced group and 14% failure at, uh, with the enhanced group with uh, adipose derived stem cells. Looking at Achilles tendinopathy with SVF, these are a uh, level two randomized control trial, SVF versus PRP single injection at 180 days. And, and as well as uh, uh, Achilles tendinopathy level one randomized control trial of leukocyte rich PRP versus SVF injection. And really uh, at six months, both improved uh, at 180 days, but SVF had a significantly earlier response. And that's why we, when I talked about platelet rich plasma, being measured at 24 months, uh, at, at 24 weeks, I, I think this is this is a, a short follow up for these orthobiologic um, treatments. From a safety standpoint, uh, we know that uh, the concerns regarding safety profile were highlighted uh, by the study Joe et al. With primary outcomes being uh, with safety and reduction, and this this study concluded that this is safe. In the SVF trials, there has been no site-related malignancies at all in all of our SVF trials. So uh, we also know that when compared uh, lipoaspirate versus uh, liposuction, lipoaspirate is a significantly a, a, with a factor of uh, 100 to 1,000 times more safe than a uh, standard liposuction uh, that is done commonly for plastic surgery. When we look at this uh, knee OA, uh, I wanna go over this. This uh, We had the VMAC versus MFAT. Uh, we know that uh, if you look at response by group, uh, KL1 had 100% response, KL2 is 76% response, KL3 is 46%, um, and KL4 is 53%. So I think this is a really good study to show uh, and talk to your patients about expectations. How, what's the chance that they're going to have a response? You know, if you have grade three and four, there's a 50% chance that you're going to have a response. And this also highlights that there's no outcome difference. Um, and that both 
BMAC and MFAT had significant improvements in pain and function, but no difference between BMAC and MFAT. So when, when do we use this? Severe disease, failed PRP, or need for structural support, because we know that we have that, that, that niche uh, that is in having housing our MSCs uh, and as well as our pericytes, so it can be used as a scaffold. Uh, I think uh, the, it shows where we use MFAP as knee arthritis, uh, rotator cuff partial tears. I think using SVF and uh, adipose stem cells requires FDA clinical trials only in the U.S., um, there are promising outcomes, uh, and this becomes really quite interesting and exciting uh, for us to have the ability to quantify, know what our dose is, as well as bank and store samples for future use. And I think this is really quite uh, exciting in, in our uh, research uh, and where our future is headed. So just to clarify, this is for U.S. Uh, FDA guidelines on the human cells, tissues, and cellular and tissue-based products. Autologous means of the same person and generally understood to mean tissue of the host will be grafted somewhere else in the same body. Minimally manipulated means processing that does not alter the original relevant characteristics of the, the tissue uh, for and that this is related to the tissue's utility for reconstruction, repair, or replacement. And then homologous use, the repair, reconstruction, or replacement or supplementation of that uh, recipient cells or tissues performs the same basic function or functions that were uh, the same in the donor. And then the manufacturer uh, of the HCTP does not involve combinations of cells or tissues or other articles, except for water, crystallized, or sterilizing, or preserving, or storing agents. Regarding adipose and the FDA guidelines, MFAT is made through mechanical processing and washing, and this qualifies as a minimum, minimal manipulation under the FDA guidelines. The utilization of enzymatic processing requires a, a FDA biologic license application, as well as a FDA trial, and so this does limit uh, clinical uh, uh, applicability at this time. Additionally, SVF and AS uh, adipose stem cells must be registered as such and can only be uh, used in an approved trial with appropriate oversight, as well as good manufacturing processes adhering to the same standards as other FDA manufacturing drugs. As far as regulatory, how should you discuss MFAT uh, to be compliant? You focus on the adipose tissue as uh, used for lubrication, structural support, mechanical support, padding, and other structural functions that are consistent with adipose. And they may also have an added benefit of regenerative and anti-inflammatory uh, potential. So conclusions supporting our orthobiologic use, I think PRP has overwhelming support for the use in NEOA, tendinopathy, ligament partial tears, and really good support for carpal tunnel syndrome, lumbar disc, ankle arthritis, and CMC. Regarding bone marrow concentrate, I think there's good support for use in NEOA, excellent support for knee bone marrow lesion, as well as hip and knee osteonecrosis, and partial thickness rotator cuff tears. Use for adipose tissues uh, supported uh, and fat use in NEOA and the elderly, Promising clinical trials and outcomes for SVF and culture expanded, uh, definitely stay tuned, but this is not ready for prime time for clinical use today. There is a gap in our orthopedic treatment algorithms between corticosteroids and surgery. I think orthobiologics helps to bridge the gap, providing options that may improve healing, improve pain and disability without the same risks of surgery. So be the change and help bridge this gap. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian and Demiris. That was a great, great presentation on orthobiologics. I even learned a lot and I've been sitting through a lot of presentations and it's, it's phenomenal how much information that you brought to the table today. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's exciting to see what, uh, Orthobiologics is doing for the health care of our individuals. Yeah. Soft tissue injuries and arthritis. Right. 
Right. It is, it, you know, this is in a really exciting time to be in medicine and especially in MSK medicine, we are on the precipice of some really altering different ways of taking care of our patients. And we are at the forefront of what's happening. And it's just really exciting to be able to offer these treatments uh, for our patients, knowing that the science behind it is very robust. Absolutely. Well, we do have a few questions. Do you sure. have time to take uh, some questions here? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Let me uh, read them off here. Um, from Kamas. Uh, it says, good morning from Indonesia. Very great presentation. I have treated OA grade two to three with PRP in my practice. I have two questions. First question is, patients always complain about increasing pain one to three days after the PRP treatment. How do you treat the pain? Second question is, the result of PRP treatment in practice was not very satisfying. What do you think about that? Thank you. Yeah, sure. So I think that the first question is uh, how, how that he's experiencing the inflammatory uh, findings after platelet-rich plasma injection intraarticularly, and that does exist, and we know that. Uh, and so, in my current practice for platelet-rich plasma, you know, you have to definitely note uh, and educate your patients so that this is to be expected. This is not alarming. This is to be expected. This is an inflammatory process that is kickstarting the natural healing process, just like any other injury. Uh, and that really what we want to do is enhance the body's ability to respond to this injury and have that normal healing cascade. Uh, so I use uh, different types of treatments. We can use um, heat, uh, which, uh, it, or infrared, we can use laser, we can use uh, Tylenol or um, acetaminophen. I, I do not use anti-inflammatories. Um, sometimes if it's quite severe or more invasive, you can use narcotic medications for that 24 to 48 hour period. Uh, but I think for the most part, educating the patient that this is expected, that this is just like any other injury. Um, and I, I think that helps set the stage quite nicely. Uh, as far as disappointing outcomes with platelet-rich plasma uh, in your clinical practice, you know, it, it, I'm going to go back to we have to know what the dose was. We have to know where we're at. Uh, so without knowing where that dosing is, I think it's going to be really hard to clarify what the outcomes should be expected. Uh, so as we go along in our research and as we clarify in our research what that dose is, I think that we can be much more um, confident that it's either going to be helpful or not helpful. I thought that the, uh, the, the research paper regarding um, how much they responded, you know, 100% of grade one uh, knee arthritis responds um, to either BMAC or SVF, uh, and, and only 50% of the KL34 uh, responded. There's been another study that was done a couple of years ago, I think in Germany, that's talked about that it's a dosing problem. It's, um, response is a dosing problem. And they did a really nice uh, trial where they broke it down and took those non-responders and redosed them and transitioned the non-responders into responders at a very high rate. So I think as we go along in our uh, research, I think the dosing and response rate is going to be really important. Now, kind of going back, I need to kind of ask you a question here for you. Going back to his first question with the pain. Now that could be single spin or double spin, correct? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, because even so the difference between the single spin and the double spin, right, is the single spin isolates that platelet rich plasma, the buffy, the buffy coat, but also has all that platelet poor plasma in it. So it's, it's going to be a lower concentration. Um, and so if you then take that and do it at a double and then spin it again, so you take the, the platelet poor, uh, that, that suspended solution uh, with all of the platelets and the platelet-poor plasma, and then you spin it again um, at a higher rate, 
uh, for a longer period of time and you get all of the platelets in pellet form at the bottom, and then you have platelet poor plasma, then you can draw off all your platelet poor plasma, you have your pellet form, and then you can decide concentration. Um, so ultimately, uh, I think what you have is that you have these inflammatory mediators in your plasma. And so it depends on what you're going for, what your concentration of platelets, but this doesn't um, negate the fact that you have your inflammatory um, cytokines. This is a cytokine mix that we haven't fully characterized. Uh, and so we're still, we're still looking at these things. Is it the platelets? Is it the inner, is it the IREP? Is it the interleukin-8? Is it the interleukin-1? We don't have all the answers yet, but what we do know, there are a lot of things that we do know, um, and that I think is helpful for us. But yeah, it's still it's still inflammatory mediated. And when you're talking about concentration of platelet-rich plasma, the higher the concentration, you have to, by design, you're still going to get more white blood cells because it's 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 a it's a it, it has to do with concentration of platelets. Um, if you're if you're concentrating the platelets 20 times baseline, uh, even if you're filtering out the majority of white cells, those white cells that are still in there are going to be higher because of the concentration. Sure, great answer. Okay, next question is from uh, let's see here for um, interdiscal injections. Yeah. Do you, do you prefer PRP? or bone marrow? Well, so I don't do interdiscal, but I do know that there are a lot of discussions about PRP versus um, bone marrow. And ultimately, I think that those are two very different things, two different entities altogether. And I think you have to be clear what your what your end goal is and, and how much invasion you're, you're really looking at and how much improvement the platelet rich plasma um, injection versus bone marrow concentrate injection is giving you. Is it worth the risk? Is it worth the cost? Is it, you have to make sure that um, the, the risk outweighs that or the benefit outweighs the risk. Uh, and I think that there's been some really interesting studies. I know uh, the study the, from Greg Lutz's group showed some really fascinating things um, of which the most concerning and fascinating is that maybe the interdiscal environment is not sterile. And additionally, this may also be uh, affected by your gut microbiome. All of these, these thoughts and the, all of these interplays between gut microbiome, inflammation, intradiscal environment not being sterile and that we can, we know we can culture out bacteria from an intradiscal uh, biopsy is, is concerning. So I know Dr. Lutz is recommending for sure um, the leukocyte rich, uh, and we know that bone marrow concentrate has very, very high white cells. And so I think this will play out uh, in the near future, what the recommendations are going to be going forward for interdiscal. Sure. Appreciate that. Um, next question is by uh, Luck. Um, hi, doctor. For use of BMAC, do you recommend using a single or double spin when processing for injections? Well, ultimately, I think you have to make sure uh, that you know what you're, what you're concentrating. And I think in order to make sure that you are getting the most concentrated um, milieu with the highest number of cells, because we do know that there, you can use the TNCC as a corollary uh, for dosing, I think that you want to make sure that you're not diluting out your um, bone marrow concentrate. I, I, so I, I would advocate that no matter what you're doing, go ahead and, and look at your TNCC, because I think what you're going to find is the double spin is going to give you a higher TNCC uh, than the single spin with the diluted out with your plasma. Okay. Another question here. Do you use PRP or bone marrow? 
on your orthopedic surgeries? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, it depends on what I'm doing, um, but I think that the literature would support um, for rotator cuff repair that I think bone marrow concentrate is uh, going to show us significantly decreased retail rate uh, versus using it alone. And that has not been borne out with um, the studies for PRP. Uh, additionally, there is a lot of concern about um, when we're doing arthroscopic surgery, uh, washing away all of the all of the growth factors. So a lot of uh, surgeons will use um, the activated platelet-rich plasma to to actually make a clot uh, to be able to sew it in um, instead of liquid PRP. Perfect. Uh Another question here. Do you recommend using BMAC with a joint capsule? Example, shoulder, knee, hip? So I think uh, what he's, or she, uh, is talking about is uh, maybe for capsular laxity or capsular injury, um, do you use platelet-rich plasma versus bone marrow concentrate? And I think, um, you know, from ease of use and from uh, from risk, I think platelet-rich plasma can get a lot of work done. I think it's in my practice, uh, it, it's a workhorse and uh, it's a majority of my patients uh, use platelet-rich plasma. And then those who either fail or have more severe disease may be candidates for either adipose or bone marrow concentrate. Sure. I have one last question here. It's kind of off the cuff here. We didn't really talk about it much. Sure. But do you use exosomes in your practice? If so, why or why not? Uh, so number one, I don't use exosomes in my practice. And currently uh, they are not um, legal to be marketed to physicians um, since the end of the import, uh, the uh, I think last year um, when the FDA actually started enforcing um, compliance. So if you're using exosomes, <laughs> keep it to yourself <laughs> or don't, <laughs> please. Well, that's all the questions that we have for this evening. Great. Well, thank and you Dr. so much uh, from, for Wysonic for uh, having me. I really appreciated the opportunity to show uh, that this is the future, and I think uh, the future is bright. Thank you so much, Dr. Demers. I will be half of Wysonic Medical. Thanks for your presentation. Again, it's excellent. <laughs> thank you so much. We really appreciate the time. Yeah, we want to cooperate with you again in the future for next uh, webinars. <laughs> Great. We will keep in touch. All right. And Mark, and Mark, also, we thanks a lot for your efforts as well. Very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. So everyone in the room, um, thank you for your watching today. I would like to invite you to join our webinar on next uh, Tuesday again. Dr. Michael Mo will present the second webinar with topic on to sound in MSK practice, shoulder. Let's stay tuned. Thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.